Welcome to New Hope's teaching ministry. Well, good morning. Good to meet you again. Uh, good to see people that we've known, uh, some for many years. Uh, some when they were very young and now they're, well, they're still young compared to us, but it's really good to see different people and there's other people we don't know. So it's good to be here. It's always good to come and visit. We just are uh, very thankful and uh, we're blessed by our relationship and friendship with Freddie and Jane over many years. So it's always good to come and encourage them in what God's called them to do. I was very interested because when Freddie asked me to come and speak, he said, we're going to be looking at the book of Philippians and uh, we do a chapter a week. So I said, oh, chapter four. So I said, oh, well, I can't just read chapter four. So I've been sitting down once or twice a week reading um, the whole of the book. And it's just amazing what's in this book. I, I dare go and do a recap or I'll never get to chapter 4. But you know, there's something in each chapter for us. And uh, chapter 2 is a model chapter about who Jesus is and his character and how we need to receive that into our lives. You know, um, I, I just died and said, we've been singing some different songs here today. And uh, one of them, I haven't sung for a while, I'm a friend of God. And a lot of people like to sing that. I'm a friend of God and he's my friend. But did you understand there's conditions to being a friend of God? A lot of people don't know that, but it's in the Bible. Um, Jesus said in John 15, You are my friend if you obey my teaching. Yeah. And just before that, he said, If you love me, obey my teachings. So if we want to be friends with God, we have to be serious about his word and put it into practice. Because Jesus said he wanted friendship with us so he could not treat us as servants, but he could reveal things to us he could make himself known and that is what friendship's about isn't it about knowing God and um, you know as we, we travel um, to, to many different nations and different cultures and you know some cultures even amongst Christians they still have arranged marriages and uh, you know if you meet somebody who just recently got married <laughs> they actually haven't got much friendship because they didn't know each other before they got married um, like they just sort of like mother and father, once I was in India and I was staying in this uh, place and the, the, the leader of this group of churches said, oh, come down to my office when you're ready. So I went and knocked on the door and he said, oh, come in. And I opened the door and there were two couples there, probably in their 50s. Had two lots of husbands and wives sitting there. I said, oh, I'm very sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. He said, no, come in, come in. He said, we're just arranging a marriage. And I said, pub. He said, yeah, we're arranging a marriage. Um, I said, uh, but we're the couple that are going to get married. They said, well, their daughter's going to marry his son. I said, but where are they? They said, oh, they haven't met yet. <laughs> wow. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> let me get out of here because this is too hard for my head to take in. I understand different cultures. And, and yeah, arranged marriages, some of them work, some of them don't. In our setting, some of our marriages work, some of ours don't. So there's no guaranteed way. It's all about relationship. But Jesus is calling us to friendship with him, but that comes out of relationship with him. Anyway, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. This is a, a lovely passage. Um, I was given verses um, 4 to about 14, I think, to, to, to read. But um, when I, I like it, when I'm in Bible schools and I teach a book of Philippians or, or Ephesians, we, I make sure we read every verse. I, you know, I cut down my teaching just to read the Word of God. There's so much power in God's Word. I know, you know, the thing that really changed my life is when I got serious about reading this book every day. Yeah. There's no point just reading it, you have to put it into practice. Yes. And that was what changed your life, uh, when you learn to read and pray. When I was a little boy in Sunday school, can you ever imagine me as a little boy? Well, uh, there was a time when I was much smaller, much younger. And we used to sing this song, uh, read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. Mm. Nothing's changed. I've changed in the last... Uh, that must have been over 60 years ago I was singing that song, <laughs> about 65 years ago probably. But, you know, I've changed, but the principle hasn't changed. Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. And so I would like us to read. I'm, I'm going to start at the beginning of, verse, of chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says this, I'm reading from, I know there's different translations, I've got my NIV with me. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, to you to whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then we come to something very relevant that's in nearly every church today. Verse 2. I plead with Yodi and I plead with Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. 
Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, help these women since they have contended at my side in this cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul is saying, hey, I've got a couple of women in your church that are not getting on with each other. Help them sort it out. Bang their heads together. Get them sorted. Come on. And that's what happens today in so many churches, isn't it? People, we come there, nice to see you, smile sweetly, but inside they say, you come and can talk to me again. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, I've been a Christian for uh, nearly 63 years. I've been involved in church leadership, actually this year is 50 years since I first stepped in church leadership. I want to tell you, I've seen so many people who not sort out their differences amongst one another. So they leave. Leave, go to another church, something happens there, leave, go to another church, eventually they just drift off and don't follow God. Why? Because they won't sort out their problems. So is there, let me ask you a question. <laughs> but please don't answer. Only to yourself. Is there somebody that if they came in this building and sat next to you, you'd be really upset with them and you want to get away from them because you have something in your heart against them? Jesus said you have to forgive from the heart. Yeah. I think I can honestly say there is nobody I feel like that about. We need to make sure we don't have anything against anyone. There you are. That wasn't that. They, I wasn't given those verses, so that's a bonus. <laughs> okay, now we get to what I'm supposed to do. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to have plenty. I'm sorry, I've been, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. So we're going to have a bit of a look here about rejoicing in the Lord. <coughs> Paul starts off here and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> hey. Always? I like it when I'm overseas and I'm working with translators, I always try to emphasise things like all and always. So I, I spell it out, I go, I go always. And the poor old translator is scratching their head, how do I do that? And I make them keep doing it until they get it. So people are getting the idea. Rejoice in the Lord always. Hey, that's what the story was about, wasn't it, today? Paul and Silas in, in Philippi in prison. <laughs> they were rejoicing in the Lord in the most difficult circumstances. And Paul said, I want to emphasise again, I'm telling you, rejoice. <clears throat> and we need to understand that we have, can have an attitude of being... Rejoicing is the outworking of joy in our lives. If we're full up with the joy of the Lord, it's not dependent on circumstances. Our circumstances do not shape whether or not we have the joy of the Lord. Why? Because in God's presence is fullness of joy. Years ago we used to have an Irishman that used to travel all over the world and he used to come to Eastbourne. Brilliant preacher. Oh, he's one of those annoying people. He had these wonderful little sayings that you couldn't improve on. And his Sunday, he was telling us one day, he said, you know, he said, I was talking to God. And I was saying, God, I'm so miserable. <laughs> and he said, I was hoping God would give me a pat on the back and said, I know, I know my son, it's very hard. The Christians I send you to, they're very difficult. And I know there's a lot of pressure. But God didn't say any of that to me. And I kept telling God, I'm so miserable. And all God kept saying is, where are you? And after about three times, I said, God, you're not listening to me. What do you mean, where am I? 
And then God said, well, in my presence is fullness of joy. So where are you? <laughs> so when we're miserable, or when we're depressed or downcast, it means we have lost the sense of God's presence. Now, uh, in some churches they go to, they talk about God is in the house. You know, God's in this house today. You know why? Because he came with me. Because the greatest revelation is to know that Christ lives in my heart through faith by the Holy Spirit. And if I know God's presence in my life, then I can learn to rejoice in all circumstances. It doesn't mean I say, oh, praise God, I've just crashed the car. Oh, praise God, somebody's whipped my wife. No, that doesn't mean that. There's some people like to go around like that. It's called stupidity. But in the midst of it, I can trust God, saying, God, you know, this wasn't meant to happen. I don't understand, but I'm not letting it rob me of my joy. I'm trusting you in the midst of these circumstances. And so Paul is telling us, learn to rejoice. And Paul was writing out of experience. He's writing this to a church where the church got birthed because he was in prison there. Out of his imprisonment, the church got birthed. All because he cast a demon out of one person. Wow. Imagine that. Just cast a demon out of one person, you get put in prison. Those days are coming, friends. Yeah. If you want to move in the power of God, expect some opposition. Yes. Get ready for it. But I want to tell you, opposition's work, but it's no comparison to the power of God. Because all it does, it ma opposition makes the power of God more available. <clears throat> and if you want to hear about that, in, at the end of June, there's a man coming to speak at Holy Trinity. You, see, you can find it. He was in prison in Sudan. He went there on mission and they put him in prison. And he saw people saved and everything while he was in prison. Saw the power of God move. I know the man personally. I've stayed in his house in Czech Republic. And you know, God used him. Everybody's praying to get him out. Him. God kept him there for about 360 days, or three, over 300 days. And out of that, people got saved, people got healed, things happened. In the midst of our difficulty, if we learn to trust God, God can break through and do something. Yes. And so Paul said that, so he's telling these people. Then in verse 8, verse 6 he says, oh verse 5 is very important. <coughs> This is something I'm still working on. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Some of us could be... Some of us are so weak that, you know, we fall over and everybody runs over us. And others are so, so the other way that we, we run over everybody. There should be a gentleness with a strength. Yes. And that should be evident to all. Then verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Uh, another translation says it like this don't worry about anything instead pray about everything tell God what you need and give him thanks for all he has done many years ago that's where I first met Freddie and Jane we got involved in a Bible week at Ashburnham years ago and one of the, the people leading prayer, leading the prayer team there was a man called Nicholas Rivet Carnack yeah. he came out of a title background and he spoke ever so posh <laughs> Not like Pete yeah. Gay. He really spoke. He was a, such a lovely gentleman. A lovely man. And um, one day he was teaching on prayer and he said, you know, he said, he said, I never used to be a man of prayer. He said, one day I said, God spoke to me. And he called me by name. He said, Nicholas. And that's how I spoke. <laughs> so he said, yes, Lord. The Lord said, Nicholas, why don't you do what my word says? He said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, well, my word says, Worry about nothing and pray about everything. He said, all you do is worry about everything and pray about nothing. <laughs> and that changed his life. And he was one of the best people I ever had heard teach on prayer. He was a man of great prayer. But you see, worry negates prayer. Now, if we're honest, it's now May the 27th. Since January the 1st to May the 27th, Probably most of us at one stage, perhaps just once, for half a minute, have worried about something. It's easy to worry, isn't it? Yeah. Read your newspaper. Yeah. You know, I tell you, I'm, I'm glad I'm old because by 20, by 20, was it 50 or something, you, you, you're going to be dying of thirst down here in the south according to the latest uh, forecast on water or something else. I would say that there's so much fear coming you through the media 
So much fear when, when you listen to people. People always talk negative. It's always the bad stuff that sells in the newspaper, not the good stuff. Yeah. And there's fear coming all the time. So you can worry about everything. Oh, wow, boy, what happens if I lose my job? And I can't get another job. There are people so worried. Did you know some of the poorest people that went from rags to riches, the most fearful people, they, they cling on their misers, they will not let go of their money in case they go back to poverty again. They can't enjoy what they've got because of a worry. And so many Christians, we worry like the world. But here it says, be anxious for nothing. Nothing, no one thing. Don't worry about anything. Wow. But how do I get rid of worry? You're not going to get rid of worry by walking up and down your road and wherever you go say, I must not worry. 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 It's like, it's like if you're on a diet, you know, like, you want to get slim like me. So you go and you're looking in the cake shop. Here. I mustn't have a jam donut. No, I mustn't have a cream cake. I mustn't have a I mustn't have a Cornish pasty. I mustn't have that. And in the end I land up I'll have a Cornish pasty, a cream slice, and a jam donut. I keep saying I mustn't, but I land up doing it. What should I do? I should go to the green grocer and say, I need an orange, I need an apple, and I need a couple of bananas. I have to replace worry with something else. So it says, do not worry, but learn to pray. Lord, I'm coming and bringing you my worry list. These are things that are bothering me. Please can you take control. Lord, I give you this. I thank you that you hear. I thank you that you answer. If you go back in your life somewhere, God has done something for you. Just start to thank him for what he's done. Yeah. Oh, oh, Lord. Lord, oh, oh, oh Lord. Oh, oh, oh Freddie, Lord, he, he said the other day you answered his prayer when he's praying for this. Thank you, Lord, you answered prayer. That gives me confidence. Learn from other people. Years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in London. He phoned, I was on the phone to him and he was telling me that somebody just given him a minibus. Virtually brand new, free of charge for his, his church. And he was set back getting excited. And all of a sudden I said, hey, hallelujah. <laughs> so I said, why are you so excited? I said, well, you've just told me if ever I need a vehicle, there's one out there with my name on it and God can get it to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> you see, you can learn from other people. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer with thanksgiving. You know, God doesn't like miseries. Oh God, it's so hard serving you. Oh God, I've got this problem. Oh God, I've got that problem. And God's thinking, oh, let's shut the, let's shut the receiver down. We thank you. Father, I thank you that because of Jesus, yes. I can come to you and I can call you my Father. Wow. That's a good way to start prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your precious blood that cleanses me from all sin. And I thank you through your precious blood, I can now come to the Father with my request. And so you start to ask God what you want. Be specific. When you have a problem, say, Lord, I have this issue. Please can you take them? Don't ask God to help you. Ask him to take over. Years ago, I was walking uh, somewhere. I was up in the north of Czech Republic and we, we'd left this building. We were walking off somewhere to a meeting and we were a bit tired. We'd been busy. And I said to my friend, I said, I just prayed out loud, Holy Spirit, please help us. And he said, wow, he said, that's a good prayer. And I thought, I said, no, that, that's not a good prayer. He said, what do you mean, not a good prayer? I said, it is a good prayer. Holy Spirit, please take over. Hallelujah. Because he comes to lead us. When you give God your problems, leave them with him. Yeah. If you have a watch like mine, and it's broken, and you take it to the repairers, you have to leave it with them. You say, oh, I've got this watch, it's broken, it's this, that, and they say, oh, yeah, we can fix that, but oh, I have to keep it on because, oh, I can't live without it. I'm no good after that. I have to give it to them. Mm. You have to give God your problems, your worries, your anxieties, your fears, and let him deal with them. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> it's gone very quiet on me now, not many hallelujahs. <laughs> For some of us, our, our problems are our security. All the time I can talk about my problem, somebody will be interested in me. Years ago when we were planting a church up in, the, up in Upfield, we had lot, quite a lot of people coming and some of them had... Every, did you know every person that comes has a problem? Some people have good problems, like they have abilities, they, they have 
They have, they want to serve. They have gifts and abilities. Other people come and they, they need help because they're, they're injured or hurt or got some hang-ups they need to get rid of. And we had this woman and uh, she had a few hang-ups. And uh, one day I came in and I saw her standing by the wall and I thought, oh, she's looking glum. So I went up to her, being a good pastor, I went up to her, I called her by her name, I said, I want to know, I said, is everything okay? This is what she said. You haven't spoken to me for the last three weeks. Oh, wow. That was a bit of a shock. I said, oh, so being a compassionate sort of person I am, Diane will tell you how compassionate I am with people. I said, I haven't spoken to you for three weeks. Yes, she said. So that means you haven't spoken to me for three weeks. So I said, well, in future, I said, when I come in, I said, I want you to come up and greet me. I said, because I want you to become part of the answer to this church. I said, because when people see what God does in your life, they will want to know and you can minister to them. I gave her a bit of a shock, but she started to come to greet me. You see, sometimes we can dwell in our problems as a security, in our fears. And we have to learn to overcome things. Now, that doesn't all happen in... A flick of a finger, often it's a process, but as we go on with God, that happens. So it says that when we learn to give God our problems, when we pray and with thanksgiving, listen what happens. It doesn't say God will answer immediately, verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow, God can do something. God can give us a peace that's beyond understanding. In Ephesians, God pours a love into us that is beyond um, experience. Like it's, uh, sorry, the, the, this one says beyond all understanding. That's right. And the other way, it just says it again in Ephesians about the love of God, which is amazing, which is beyond, um, surpasses knowledge. God can do things for us way beyond anything we can understand. You can have a peace of God in your life that seems strange to everybody else because of your circumstances. Probably the greatest time I've known the peace of God, or one of the times I can remember God's peace in the midst of a difficult circumstance, was this. I'd gone to Uganda, I had a team with me, I had a guy from England, I had two guys from America, and we'd been working in, in the, near the city of Kampala, but then we left one weekend to go off way out to the border, I think, with Congo, we was going to have a mission there. We had a, we had pastors' conference, and then we were doing some. I had a team of uh, Africans who were preaching the gospel. We were having a wonderful time, and uh, we get to Sunday morning, and um, we're having this service, the last main service of our sort of conference thing. Uh, the evangelism is going to carry on for a few more nights, but anyway, so. So just as we finished the meeting, I, I put me up to preach and, and I just prayed the blessing over all these people. And all of a sudden, as I opened my eyes, they, they put two men in front of us. Both these men are demonised. I've been see, seeing them in the week. One man's walking around throwing grass in the air. One man's got his feet tied together. Another one's got his hands tied together on a big log. And then these were demonised people. And they bring these two demonized people and stand right in the front, like here, in front of me. And I said, please pray for these people to be set free. And I remember thinking to myself, this is no problem for God. Because we've prayed for many demonized people. You know, a lot of people have problems in their lives and behind it is some stronghold that is because of their hurt. They've opened the door and they need to be set free. We hope you've enjoyed today's teaching. If you have any comments or prayer requests, please get in touch. God bless you.